smooth. And are bats blood-sucking vermin or a gardener's delight? You be the judge. Plus, garden gadgets to keep it neat. Next. <laughs> Yesterday, I had the opportunity to witness a tree planting on a grand scale. So grand, in fact, that it quickly became more than a mere tree planting. It became an event. So it's no wonder it attracted the attention of lots of people. Apparently, this is supposed to be the biggest tree that's ever planted here in Tulsa. Local news crews, newspaper reporters, state foresters, city horticulturists, and neighbors. And why it attracted my attention as well. It's a big tree. It also required the expertise of approximately 25 guys who were responsible for the survival of the tree. This is the biggest tree we've ever moved. And just after daybreak, they got busy readying the 240-ton crane that would lift the tree from the front yard of a private residence, up and over the two-story house, and into the backyard, where a tree similar in grandeur once stood but was toppled in a windstorm. I need one of your guys on your side of the truck right. hold traffic back and direct it. That process required dozens of sheets of plywood to protect the driveway from the weight of the crane. Large pads beneath the outriggers that helped stabilize the crane, also to protect the driveway, and massive counterweights to prevent the crane from tipping over. From beginning to end, just getting the crane ready took about two hours. It's gonna be fun. I like big stuff. And while all that was going on, the tree, a 32-foot willow oak, arrived unscathed and on schedule. Everywhere I go, I'm in the way. The tree's original home was a spot just outside of Houston, Texas, where it was carefully dug up, a process that actually took several months, loaded onto a trailer and hauled several hundred miles to Tulsa. <laughs> it even spent the night in a hotel parking lot. The tree's root bulb, which weighed in at a staggering 36,000 pounds, was 15 feet wide, but only about three feet deep. That may seem strange at first glance, but given that 80 to 90% of a tree's roots are in the top two feet of soil, the width of the root ball is far more important than the depth. Once the trailer backed into the driveway, workers began attaching chains and all the necessary hardware to the pipes supporting the root ball to get the tree upright. With that task complete, they made final preparations to lift the tree. I'm a tree hugger. Okay, take her on up. All kidding aside, I've got to tell you folks, as the crane began to lift the tree, the job site got so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Got to admit, that's far better than the sound made by a 20-ton tree dropping. And now, the moment of truth. But the silence was quickly broken by a chorus of oohs and ahs as the crane hoisted the tree up higher and higher and higher against the backdrop of a clear blue sky. Over the top of the house, and let me tell you, that was yet another tense moment, began its descent into the backyard and was gently dropped into the prepared planting hole. And the contractors couldn't have asked for better weather. You see, just two days ago, winds were howling here at around 30 miles an hour, and high winds can wreak havoc on a tree teetering high above a house. But thankfully, yesterday, winds were calm. Anyway, the only glitch in the process up to this point was an unforeseen one. The tree wasn't quite level in the planting hole. They're going to have to excavate it out on that, on that end yeah, fill or, on or end. fill on this end. It's going to be easier. There's so much roots down there. It's going to be easier to fill. Than okay. Than All right. Then we got her But that situation was quickly and easily resolved by adding a bit of soil beneath the low side of the root ball. Workers then began filling the planting hole with the soil excavated from the planting hole. In other words, they used only the native soil, no soil amendments. And that's definitely the way to go, because the tree's root system needs to adapt to the native soil beyond the planting hole, so that in time, the roots will firmly anchor the tree in place. It's also worth mentioning that the contractors chose not to stake the tree. 
because the weight of the root ball was sufficient to stabilize it. And in truth, a tree will develop better wood density if the trunk is allowed to gently sway in the wind, something most staking systems actually prevent. And that a series of drain pipes were installed in the planting hole to divert water from the nearby patio away from the root ball. After all, a certain amount of water is perfectly fine, but too much can threaten the health of the tree. And by the way, in the months to come, the soil will be treated with various biological stimulants, including beneficial fungi known as mycorrhiza, to help ensure the survivability of the tree. With the tree in the ground, it was time to cut loose. The branches, that is. And to everyone's surprise, they relaxed immediately and assumed a near normal shape. Of course, come spring, this tree will look even better. But there is something to be said of a tree's naked beauty, don't you think? I'm sure you're wondering just how much a large-scale tree planting might cost. Well, I promised a homeowner I wouldn't reveal the price tag, so let me put it to you this way. Would you rather have a high-end SUV or a really big tree? From big time to small fry. Next, transplanting trees on a slider scale. And later, are bats really blind? We'll debunk the myths. This program... Okay, now that you've seen all the steps involved in moving a really big tree, what do you say I shrink the scale a bit? Say on the order of something that you can actually do at home without spending a small fortune. This is a purple-leaved katsura, a cute little tree that I'm ready to move. Katsuras are in the genus Cercidophyllum. They're native to Japan, are hardy to zone four, and they're among my favorite trees, even though, for some reason, they're not particularly well known. I also have a weeping version, and it's my favorite tree of all. Anyway, the method I'll use to move this little baby applies to any tree you might want to move, regardless of size. First, I'll dig up a root ball, and the rule of thumb as to how big the root ball should be is simple. The bigger, the better. Now I'll lift the tree out of the ground, place it in my new truck so I can carry it to its new home, plop it into the new planting hole, which I dug earlier, pack the soil gently but firmly around the root ball. I guess I could have worn gloves. Water well and mulch. As you can see, this tree is dormant, which is, after all, the best time to move deciduous plants. That way, they'll have a chance to develop a good, strong root system before they leap out and begin actively growing. Then they won't be so stressed out by the move. And in just a few weeks, this little guy should leap out as usual and be just fine. My purpose in showing you how trees are transplanted, both large trees and small trees, is straightforward enough. I want you to develop the confidence it takes to actually move a tree or have someone do it for you. So if you've got a tree at your place that needs to be moved, Move it! Next, the truth about bats. Inviting them into your garden might just be the best thing you can do. And later, it may look like a gadget, but actually, it's a garden tip. The mere mention of the word bats conjures up images of blood-sucking, rabies-infested creatures. But they don't want to suck your blood. The truth is, bats can be very beneficial in the garden. First off, bats are a natural insecticide. Just one bat is capable of devouring more than 500 night-flying insects in a single hour. While mosquitoes are a preferred dish of hungry bats, they also consume leafhoppers, scorpions, mealworms, cucumber beetles, flies, and moths. What's more, bats provide nutrient-rich fertilizer in the form of bat guano, which is high in both phosphorus and nitrogen. And although it may be a matter of personal preference, who could resist this cute little mug? <laughs> Batwoman Dharma Weber is here to debunk the myths that surround these fluttering furries. And the biggest myth about bats is that they feed off blood. We have 45 different species of bats. 42 of them eat an insect. The last three are nectar and pollen feeders. A bat like Biggie here can eat half his weight in crickets a night. An entire roost can devour even more. Now this is why you want them in your garden. These guys are actually the mosquito eaters. They can eat up to 1,200 mosquitoes every single hour. Another myth plaguing these critters is that they've been characterized as flying rodents. Now, 
bats, not related to rodents at all. They actually are in a classification all of their own, which is called chiropteran, which means hand wing. That's because the parts on the wing that look like the sticks of a kite are actually fingers. And what about the concern that they spread rabies? The truth about bats and rabies is they do not get it any more than any other mammal. They simply don't. It's one in a thousand. Ever heard the saying, blind as a bat? Well, that's myth number four. But they don't just use their sight to find their dinner. That chirping sound is one tool bats use to find insects. They also hunt by using an inaudible sonic sound known as echolocation. Because on nights when there is no moon, when it's very dark, they'll still be able to hunt and rescue your garden. Now that you know that their bad rap is pure fiction, let's meet some of these batty characters. This is a subspecies that's found a lot in Northern California and along the coast called a Pacific palette. His very favorite food, and this is really important for the garden, centipedes and scorpions. Biggie, the guy you met earlier, is a big brown, but really, he's no bigger than a deck of cards. Biggie is an average size for a bat. Worldwide, there's about 1,100 different kinds of bats. Half of them are his size or smaller. Now, this is Otis. And Otis is a little brown bat. When I put him beside Biggie, you can tell there's a definite, si a definite difference in size. The little brown's wings are small, so it won't travel far from where it calls home. The Mexican free tail has longer and more slender wings. It feeds on high altitude moths and is common in warmer parts of the U.S. Just like birds, you have a long skinny wing, you fly really fast. Of course, one of the great perks of these critters inhabiting the landscape is the nutrient-rich guano they expel. But before you can harvest the fruits of, well, the bat's labor, you have to build a bat house. So, let's get to work. Now, we're, this kit is made from cedar, but if you decide to make one from scratch, you can make it from any type of wood that is not toxic to the bat. So we're talking no pressure-treated wood, but anything else is just fine. Since this kit features tongue and groove construction, assembly is a cinch. Then you're going to put screening or something for the bats. They're going to land on it and then travel up inside your bat house. A word of warning, stay away from using fish netting that could snag on a bat's wings. Also, extruding staples can be hazardous, so Dharma pounds them in so that they're flush. After this, we're going to go ahead and put the sides on and the top. Once the box is assembled, a few screws will secure the structure. Okay, and then we're just going to go ahead and put the front portions on our bat house also. We're going to go ahead and slide them in. Since bats like a cozy home, Make sure there's about three quarters of an inch of space in the chamber. Also, you need to go ahead and paint your bat house. You can um, use a latex paint, do at least two coats. So now that we have a bat house, what shall we do with it? Since not everyone has a barn to attach their bat house to, you can use a pole. Then, find an open area where your bat house can face southeast. This will ensure the bat house gets the most morning sunlight. Ideally, most bat species like between four and seven hours of direct sunlight per day. Once you get occupants in your bat house and they start providing you with nutrient-rich guano, you'll want to collect it onto a plastic sheet. What you're going to do is you're going to take a tablespoon full of guano and you're going to mix it with a gallon of water and let it sit overnight. And that's it. And so then the next day, you're ready to go. Just give it a shake and you've got your own fertilizer. See folks, while bats may be the culprit in vampire movies, to the average gardener, these cute little critters are like little gardening angels. If you want to invite bats into your yard, you need to welcome them appropriately. That means omitting the use of all pesticides as they can cause serious harm to the little critters. Do you want your hose to be naughty or nice? Next, clever gizmos to keep things tidy. National featuring new gardening gadgets and gizmos. And for two reasons. For one, they're really cool. 
But more importantly, perhaps, <laughs> I just love saying the word gizmo. Gizmo, 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 gizmo. 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 First up is a time-saving, space-saving multi-tool that's actually four tools in one. It's a broom, it's a garden rake, it's a leaf rake, and it's a hoe slash cultivator slash weeder. The various steel attachments quickly and easily connect and disconnect to one handle. And they aren't cheap, flimsy tools. They're well made and they handle well. A number of different manufacturers offer these multi-tool products. And they're great for gardeners who don't want to carry three or four different tools out to the garden, or who don't have a lot of storage space, or both. Next up is a clever hose storage gizmo that's as unique as it is functional and strange looking. All you do is mount the gizmo to a wall or tree, then loop three to five foot lengths of hose into the little openings, what the manufacturer calls toes. And there you have it. 50 feet of hose, ready to roll or unroll, as the case may be. Ever heard an English gardener say compost? They say compost. It's kind of cute, really, as are a number of other gardening terms from Great Britain, such as tip, the name for a pile into which you tip garden refuse or rubbish. Of course, we Americans are much more sophisticated linguistically. You see, we don't actually tip our garden refuse or rubbish. Instead, we dump it, which is why we call the same pile a dump. Anyway, to properly gather such refuse or rubbish, one needs a proper receptacle known as a tip bag, which you've got to admit sounds better than a dump bag. And this one is jolly good. It's got holes in the bottom for drainage. It's made of a special mildew-resistant material that'll last for years, and it collapses on itself going from 28 inches tall to a mere three inches tall, which makes storage a snap. The two padded handles at the top of the bag are firmly attached, and there's a third handle at the bottom of the bag to make tipping, or dumping as the case may be, a whole lot easier on the old back. Another interesting English garden term is trug, meaning a wooden basket for carrying fruits and vegetables, or in this case, fruit snacks. Well, here's a modern-day version of the same thing, made of recycled plastic. And while it, too, is great for carrying fruits and vegetables, it also works great for hauling and pouring water. This model, which is available in assorted colors, is actually used in Spain at harvest time. In fact, it was made in Spain, although it works fine here at my place, which is mainly on the plain. wonder if we're going to get any rain. So tell me. How many hose-end sprayers have you purchased in the last five years? Well, in my case, it's probably at least a dozen, maybe more. Now, I'll admit I'm tough on these things. I drop them, I leave them out in the elements, I even run over them with my car. Still, I get annoyed at how quickly they leak or flat out fall apart. So I bought this one, which the manufacturer claims is so tough you can actually drive a car over it. What's more, it's simple to adjust the stream from soft to coarse. If you like to be on the leading edge within the world of gardening, then check out this new edging material. It's made of flexible fiberglass, which means unlike metal, plastic, or wooden edging, it won't rust, warp, <laughs> or rot. And its color is actually embedded into the material, so it won't crack, peel, or fade. Installation is simple and straightforward. First, I use a half-moon shovel to cut through the sod to accommodate the edging. I then install the edging and tap it down gently with a hammer, protecting the edging with a piece of wood. Then, I pound in the provided stakes, and that's it. And look how easy it is to make all kinds of bends and curves. One more nice thing about this edging material, it doesn't have any sharp edges, which means it's great to use in areas where you've got a bunch of kids or dogs or whatever running around. Getting back to tools, I've got three more new ones to show you. This is a trenching tool, and it's great for digging trenches to accommodate irrigation lines, drainage lines, even for digging planting holes. It's based on the design of a Swedish tool used for fighting forest fires. And at just over three pounds, it doesn't wear you out as quickly as a more conventional and much heavier hoe. This curious looking gizmo was designed to do one thing and one thing only. Break rocks. 
and it performs magnificently, raking rocks between three quarters of an inch to four inches in diameter within the top few inches of soil. And once you've gathered a pile of rocks, you simply use the basket-shaped head to scoop them up and deposit them elsewhere. While I'm on the subject of rakes, have a gander at this gizmo. This is a power rake, and it's about as multifunctional as a rake can be. As a leaf rake, it's a real back saver because it simply glides over the leaves on the push stroke, and on the pull stroke, the upper shield prevents leaves from tumbling over the tines, all without you having to ever lift the rake at all. It also does a good job of raking and leveling the soil or mulch, even dethatching the lawn. And opposite the business end of this gizmo is a rotating grip that reduces wrist strain. The thing I look for most in new gardening gadgets and gizmos is how functional they are, how well they perform specific tasks. But it's also nice when gardening gadgets and gizmos are simply fun to use. And let's face it, you can't spell functional without fun. Check out more cool gear to make gardening easier. Go to HGTV.com.